Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome to Nerve Puzzle number eight. This case, as all other cases, are purely hypothetical and any resemblance to any individual is purely coincidental. Let's start. We have a 56-year-old gentleman who is a right-handed scaffolder, who has fallen from a height and has had a fracture dislocation of his left hip. He was operated upon immediately and awoke with weakness of the left ankle to both dorsiflexion and plantar flexion and there is associated numbness across the foot and the lateral calf. There was no improvement six weeks later, prompting neurophysiological assessment. On clinical examination, appearance showed some muscle wasting below the knee, particularly in the anterior compartment. Tone was reduced on left ankle movement. Power was reduced two out of five on dorsiflexion and four out of five on inversion and plantar version. Sensation was reduced to pinprick in the lateral calf and the whole of the foot. Let's consider the differential here. Could this be a single nerve lesion? Well, if we start with the perineal nerve, yes, we've got weakness of ankle dorsiflexion, but we also have got weakness of plantar flexion and inversion too. So it's also involving tibial nerve fibers as well. Could this be a combination of the two? So per perineal nerve lesions and tibial nerve lesions? Well, yes, this is a polytrauma case. So that's certainly something that we can consider. Could this be something higher up? for example a sciatic nerve lesion well yes certainly it could be it's involving the tibial and the perineal nerve fibers and so that's certainly a possibility of sciatic nerve lesion could it be higher still a lumbosacral plexopathy yes that's certainly possible this is a polytrauma type case and there could have easily been hematomas and so forth up in the pelvis that's a possibility could this be higher up at the uh, lumbosacral level uh, for radiculopathies. Yes, that's also a possibility too, depending on the nature of the polytrauma. So how are we gonna sort this all out? Let's have a look at the neurophysiology and see what we can discover. Let's start by having a look at the sensory nerve action potentials. The left superficial perineal sensory response is greatly reduced. It's just two microvolts compared to 15 on the other side. And the sorrel sensory response is also reduced at six microvolts compared to 26 on the other side. So what we're dealing with over here is a postganglionic process. Let's have a look at the motor amplitudes and on the perineal EDB motor studies, we can see normal conduction velocities. However, we can see greatly reduced motor amplitudes, 0.5 versus 5.4 to the other side. And also for the tibial AH motor responses, we've got 3.6 millivolts versus 15.3 on the other side. So we can see reduced sensory responses and reduced motor responses. Let's have a look at the EMG. If we have a look at the tibialis anterior and the biceps femoris short head, we can see good going active denervation with small units at high rates and lots of fibrillations. Contrast that with the tibial nerve where there's also denervation, but not quite as bad in the gastrocnemius and the semimembranosus muscles. If we have a look at the gluteal muscles higher up, these are normal, as are the rectus femoris, vastus medialis muscles and the lumbar paraspinals as well. Let's put this all together now. So if we have a look at the sensory responses, we've got reduction in the perineal and tibial sensory responses. So it's a postganglionic lesion affecting these fibers. We've got reduced motor responses too, more affecting the perineal nerve innervated muscle of the EDB than the tibial innervated muscle, which is the AH. We can see on EMG, uh, on a selection of different muscles that the perineal division innervated muscles are more affected than the tibial innervated muscles and that the um, degree of denervation is quite severe, it's quite acute and it's not affecting the gluteals which are a little bit higher up or the lumbar paraspinals or any of the femoral innervated muscles. So in conclusion we've got a severe acute left-sided sciatic nerve lesion. Let's go through a couple of clinical points. First of all, sciatic nerve lesions tend to be traumatic in nature, whether that's been from a fracture, a dislocation, uh, perioperative uh, complications, gunshot wounds. Um, these tend to be the bulk of causes. More rarely, there can be tumors arising around the nerves 
or inflammatory or infiltrative type of conditions um, and when these are the cause they tend to be quite painful and so if you see a patient with a painful progressive foot drop these are really the kind of things that you have to be thinking about and imaging the whole course of the sciatic nerve very carefully to look for any of those potential causes. The next thing which is quite interesting when you examine the patient clinically is that on the whole, and it's not always the case, but on the whole, uh, there tends to be sensory sparing of the medial aspect of the foot because that's innervated by the saphenous nerve which arises from the femoral nerve. The perineal nerve division tends to be more susceptible to damage than the tibial nerve division within the sciatic nerve. And that's a very typical type of pattern that we see with sciatic nerve lesions. That it tends to pick off more of the perineal fibres more than the tibial fibres, though I have seen this the other way around too. The final clinical thing I'd just like to mention, and just for really clarification purposes, is that a lot of people get confused between sciatica and sciatic nerve. Sciatica is pain radiating down the course of the sciatic nerve, usually from lumbar radiculopathies. Sciatic nerve lesions are literally lesions of the sciatic nerve. Very, very different, totally different management and investigation. A couple of neurophysiological points. The first one is, as always, pre- and post-ganglionic lesion localization depends entirely upon the quality of your sensory nerve studies. So it's really important to get those right and to be confident as to whether or not the sensory nerve responses are impaired or not. The next point I'd like to make is uh, lesion localization of the perineal nerve. Um, really useful to check the EMG of the short head of biceps femoris and also to do sensory nerve studies of the actual cutaneous nerve of the calf to see whether the lesion is above the fibular neck or below it because if there's any abnormality of the short head of the biceps femoris on EMG or if there's a reduction in sensory response to the lateral cutaneous nerve of the calf then one has a lesion above the fibular neck. The next point is when the tibial nerve division is affected within a sciatic nerve lesion, then it's quite useful to try and localize the level of the lesion by assessing the hamstrings uh, to see exactly at what point the sciatic nerve has become uh, impaired. Gluteal muscle sampling is super important in differentiating between a sciatic nerve lesion from lumbosacral plexopathies because their innervation from the superior and inferior gluteal nerves arises from the lumbosacral plexus, whereas the sciatic nerve does not supply these muscles. And so if there isn't any impairment of these muscles, then the level of the lesion is higher up at the lumbosacral plexus rather than the sciatic nerve. The final thing I'm going to say is that piriformis syndrome is something that we can assess, but it is vanishingly rare and it should be at the bottom of a differential list whenever a patient has got sciatic nerve uh, problems. So thank you very much for watching the video. I hope you've found it enjoyable and useful. If you have, please do support the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing. Your support is greatly appreciated and I hope to see you in the next video soon.